Um, my name is Michael Summers and I'm president of the local chapter here of the Ireland US Council. So on behalf of the council I'm delighted to welcome you all here today, uh, both from the United States and from Ireland and it's a great pleasure to, to be able to stand up here before you all. Without sponsors, uh, it would be very difficult to actually stage these events, so we're very grateful, obviously, to all our sponsors. And uh, I want to thank the Bank of Ireland Corporate Banking for their great assistance. Uh, that kind of comes hard for me being the State Director on the Board of AIB, but so be it. <laughs> Um, so, my next pleasant task uh, is to welcome our fellow council member and sponsor for today's lunch, uh, Derek Collins from the Bank of Ireland. So, Derek, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, as I said, it's, a, it's always a, a pleasure uh, to be here and, um, as I said, to enjoy the um, the friendly uh, environment that we have here at the Ireland US Council lunch. So firstly, my role here is to introduce the um, guest speaker for the council program today. It is now my special privilege to welcome Lucinda Crichton. She is chief executive of Vulcan Consulting, which she founded to offer specialist advice to growing businesses and multinationals, companies on complex domestic and regulatory affairs, in particular in relation to the EU. She is a former Minister of State for, for European Affairs and was also elected to Dáil Éireann as a TD and served from 2007-2016 and I'm very pleased she was in our constituency and she really served the constituency of Dublin South East with great aplomb. She's a native of County Mayo and received an LLB from Trinity College Dublin and later a BL degree from King's in Dublin. She was called to the bar in 2005. In 2003, she qualified as an attorney at law in the state of New York. Vulcan Consulting is headquartered in the heart of Dublin and has a significant presence in Brussels. The triggering of Brexit the week before last is top of mind in business and government circles in Ireland. Lucinda consults with many American corporations operating in Ireland and throughout Europe. With her business and government backgrounds, I know you will agree that she has a distinctive vantage point from which to offer a unique perspective. I am delighted to ask you to join me in welcoming Lucinda to address you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was quite a, a nice introduction. I very much appreciate it. And um, I want to firstly, I suppose, begin by thanking uh, David and Roddy and, of course, the esteemed chairman, Michael, uh, for the invitation to be with you today. Um, it's not my first time, I think it's fair to say, at an Ireland-US Council uh, event. I've been at quite a few down through the years. I was honoured to speak. Um, at one of the um, summer balls in uh, Dublin Castle some years ago, um, which I enjoyed uh, to a great extent. And I was lucky enough to attend the winter meeting in Florida um, a couple of months ago. Um, I think that's the last time I saw Roddy. I'm fairly sure he was just about to start dancing on the tables in some bar, um, right at the point that I decided it was time to go home. Um, but it was a great fun, very dynamic event, and I think that that is the hallmark of all of the Ireland-US Council meetings, um, and it's always, it's always a pleasure to be involved and, um, and to have a little bit of fun in the process as well. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about Brexit, um, and I'm conscious that most of the people in the room have not just a European focus, of course, but also an American, a US fo focus. Um, as I do myself in my, in my line of work these days. Um, and, you know, I suppose one of the things that I'm asked to do a lot is to join panel discussions and to participate in debates about 
the sort of global environment, global uncertainty, and um, and obviously uh, the outcome of the U.S. presidential election is often cited along with um, with Brexit and other forthcoming elections in Europe as as examples of the sort of uncertain times that we live in. Uh, and there is no doubt that there are uncertainties and there are new challenges facing Ireland. And I suppose when you look across um, the Atlantic at the US, one of the issues that I, I certainly am watching closely and following um, almost on a day-to-day -day basis is the whole issue of tax reform, um, which I think is a great opportunity for the US administration. It's one where I think there will be a meeting of minds. Um, and as other issues um, perhaps pose greater challenges to the new, new administration, than might have been anticipated, like around healthcare and so on, I think it, it, it's going to firmly come onto the agenda. And um, it's not a bad thing, it's uh, arguably overdue, um, but it is one that will present a new challenge for us um, as a hub for so many US multinational companies in Ireland, and it's one that we need to be conscious of. Um, obviously then, our relationship with the European Union, our relationship with the United Kingdom is another challenge that's uh, coming pretty quickly down the tracks, but again, one that I think um, presents significant challenges, but also opportunities, and I'd like to talk a little bit about a few of those. Um, from Ireland's point of view, we are uniquely placed, and I know we constantly hear this refrain of we are you know, well, soon to be the only English-speaking member state um, in the European Union, unless you count Malta, but, um, but anyone who visits Malta knows that Maltese is the first language in Malta. Um, we are the, currently the only EU member, uh, English uh, speaking member state in the Eurozone, and that is a distinct and important advantage. But also culturally, um, particularly when American firms, but also you know, potentially Canadian, Australian, other English speaking uh, economic powerhouses around the world look at the European Union. They certainly see Ireland as a place that's easy to do business, similar legal systems, uh, quite a lot of transparency, um, and culturally we are uh, very, very similar. And that is a huge strength. It's one that I think we risk downplaying, and I think it's one that we really now need to amplify across the globe, and particularly to our partners in the US, both those that, are, that currently have a presence here, but also those who might consider it um, in the future in light of Brexit. Um, and the other thing that I think is a huge opportunity, which we have given very little treatment to in recent times, is the opportunity for new trade agreements between the European Union and the rest of uh, the rest of the world. Um, and th this is one that I think a lot of people have so sort of almost forgotten about because TTIP has has hit. I won't say it's hit the rocks, but it's certainly on ice for some time. I think we can anticipate. Um, and that's a disappointment. Uh, I was one of the people involved in government in setting the. The, um, the parameters for the TTIP negotiations when Ireland had the presidency back in 2013. We agreed the mandate between all of the EU member states and kicked off the negotiations. Unfortunately, it looks like it's not, it's not to be in the near future, but it will come back on stream. But while you know, we have this, I, I guess, greater sense of nationalism, of, of, of protectionism in the US, other parts of the world are opening up, and that presents a big opportunity. And even since Brexit, there has been a, uh, or since the vote last June, there has been a greater momentum towards new trade deals in the EU. For example, the EU-Japan trade deal is very much um, a building ahead of steam. Uh, the EU-India trade deal, which was effectively blocked because of differences between the UK and India over the last number of years, is now back on track with new political momentum. Um, and we have also seen, it, it, just this week, um, a, re, a reaffirmation of commitment from the Australian side to an EU-Australia trade deal. So these present new opportunities, new markets and so on. And I'm just giving, I suppose I'm, I'm setting them out as an example because everybody seems to be so negative, and I probably include myself in that, about the, um, about the trade ramifications for Irish industry um, surrounding Brexit, or at least the potential negatives. Um, but there are so many other opportunities. And I think we have to remember, the government has set out very clearly, I think it was the right thing to do, I'm sure there'll be other views in the room, um, that our future as a country, as a nation, lies at the heart of the European Union. And having set that out so clearly, um, we now need to really aggressively go after the opportunities that exist for us as this sort of gateway, um, to steal that phrase, that gateway into the European Union. Um, and of course, I suppose the third area of opportunity that I see 
is, um, is from uh, particularly financial services, not just financial services, but particularly financial services um, that have to re reassess their model now within the European Union because of the UK's decision to leave. Um, the changes that uh, will inevitably occur in relation to passporting rights, uh, which affect all, all range of industries and financial services from banking um, to fund management and so on, uh, insurance, uh, and there are opportunities there. Some slightly worrying signs in recent, uh, recent weeks, um, but nonetheless opportunities that we need to prepare for and grasp. So, you know, while it's, it's, it's very easy to be pessimistic at the moment, I, I think we have to focus on the positives, but we don't just need to talk about them, we need to actually, you know, uh, embrace them and, uh, and build a plan around them. Um, in terms of the Brexit negotiations themselves, um, uh, it depends really, I, I guess, on your perspective. A lot of people uh, here, uh, as I find when I travel to the US, when I go and meet with firms in New York and Washington in particular, they're very much getting a one-sided view of how this is going to proceed because they're very much getting um, the UK perspective because they tend to have large presence in London, probably bigger than in most other EU member states. And obviously the London press and the London media and indeed London advisory firms in many instances will give a very London-centric view of Brexit and the future of the EU and the future of relations between the EU and the UK and the future of these Article 50 negotiations. And I think that is a real risk. Um, so anybody that I'm talking to, I tend to advise them that they very, very quickly need to look not just to their contacts and to the advice that they will receive in London, but also start looking uh, much more widely at the other EU capitals and, of course, Brussels, um, which is where the, the institutions are based and where um, the hub of all activity really will be. Um, and you will hear uh, quite a lot from the UK, from government circles, um, from the sort of political class, but also from business, that you know, the approach is going to be very much one of sort of divide and conquer, that the European Union isn't great at sticking together. Um, it's quite easy to sow seeds of conflict between EU member states, and that that is how um, you know, the UK ultimately will extract a, a very, a very um, good deal from their point of view, um, and the EU ultimately will capitulate. Um, I think that that is a very naive view. It's one that I would certainly question. Um, and I think that it underestimates just how much there is to lose on the EU side um, by having a softer approach to, to these negotiations. I don't anticipate a soft approach. And the main reason for that is that whether you're Ireland or whether you're Greece or whether you're Poland, actually irrespective of what member state you come from, um, by and large, centrist administration, centrist governments are in, are in control at the moment. Um, and they face a threat. They generally face a threat either from the radical left, who are typically anti-authority, anti-institution, and therefore anti-European Union, um, uh, but equally from sort of a populist, hard-right nationalist movements, which are also um, anti-authority, anti-EU, uh, anti-the institutions, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and that is a threat that almost every government in Europe faces at the moment. Um, and they are unlikely, uh, I would say, it is an impossibility uh, that they will just roll over and um, give the UK everything that they have set out uh, as priorities in Theresa May's letter and in her previous uh, utterances. In other words, they are not going to simply agree that it's okay for a member state of the European Union to leave the single market, well, firstly, to leave the EU um, as, as, it, um, as it exists, but, it, but, but simultaneously to pull out of the single market and pull out of the customs union while benefiting from all of the advantages of membership of, of all of those three clubs, if you like. Um, it simply won't happen. And anybody who expects that that will be a, a sort of an easy trade-off, I think, will be very sorely disappointed. Um, and if we want a sort of a, a really clear example of this, um, one that is um, writ large, as they say, uh, it's probably the French elections that are coming up. I would argue that the French elections that will happen in May of this year 
first round this month actually, but th that they actually present a greater th threat to the, to the future and stability of the European Union, a much greater threat in fact than Brexit itself. And the reason for that is that you have a strong candidate leading from the hard right, Marine Le Pen of the Front National, um, who not only wants to pull out of the, um, the EU, which we could probably live with, uh, although, of course, um, an EU without France would be a very strange place, um, but also out of the monetary union, so uh, effectively imploding the currency. Um, that's a pretty serious prospect um, that faces all of us. And while the markets haven't really factored it in yet, and most political pundits say that she won't win and she doesn't really have a chance, you know, we heard a lot of that in 2016. And... Uh, the pundits didn't always prove to be right, so I would be very low to write her off. Um, I think that uh, anybody who doesn't take seriously the, the prospect or the possibility of a Le Pen victory um, is very naive indeed. Um, and I think that it is just one of the risk factors around um, the European Union at the moment that will shape attitudes towards Brexit. It's just one. You have German elections coming uh, in September. Um, Chancellor Merkel, who has been the sort of linchpin of the of the European political scene for, for, um, for almost 15 years now um, is also fighting for her political survival. The threat isn't coming from a radical Eurosceptic party, but it is coming um, actually from a more pro-European, more pro-federal candidate who will arguably give the UK a tougher time in negotiations than Chancellor Merkel, who has actually been quite reasonably pragmatic throughout this whole process. Um, so that's another uh, risk factor that's facing us in the near future. Um, in terms of the, the timeline, uh, it's going to be uh, a very short negotiation. Uh, Article 50 is a two-year, it's, uh, it's set in the treaties, you've heard a lot about it, it's a two-year process triggered on the 29th of March, therefore has to conclude uh, by the 29th of March 2019. Um, but the problem is that with all of these elections coming up, and the process of agreeing the negotiating positions and so on over the next couple of months. Um, the substantive negotiations actually won't begin until um, October of 2017. And because the ratif ratification process is so complex, so once there's a deal agreed on, uh, at the end of the, uh, of the Article 50 process, it has to be ratified by the Council, by the UK Parliament, and, of course, rather trickily, I, I anticipate, by the European Parliament, um, and that's going to take several months. So, in fact, the negotiations will have to conclude by October 2018, and Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, has said that. So that means instead of a 24-month negotiating period, you have a 12-month negotiating period. Um, so when you start thinking about the tens of thousands of directives, regulations, um, and, uh, and policies that the UK is inextricably a part of, um, going back 43 years, um, I think you'll start to um, realise pretty quickly that um, you know, this is going to be a very difficult, uh, very complex uh, extraction process, and 12 months is not a very long t period of time to do it, when you consider that the Canadian free trade deal, uh, for example, uh, took uh, nearly 10 years. Um, you know, that's just to put it in context, this is a very, very difficult ask. So when uh, the UK government talk about a new free, free trade agreement potentially being negotiated, or at least the parameters of it being agreed in that period of time simultaneously, I think we can just, um, you know, realistically say that is absolutely not going to happen. So what you will have um, as the key points of negotiation during the Article 50 period, which is the kind of the separation proceedings, um, will be around the um, position of EU citizens, uh, which obviously will have a big bearing for many, many companies in, in Dublin and London and elsewhere, um, because we're all so used to being able to move freely from into and out of, uh, out of UK, moving staff around, hiring and firing talent and so on. Um, that is going to potentially be... Um, a big, a big issue post-Brexit. Certainly going to be a very substantial part of the negotiations over the next um, um, 18 months or so. Um, you're going to have a, the mother of all ding-dongs over the budget. Um, um, so the EU are claiming that the UK will have to settle a bill of almost um, 62 billion euro. Um, that's to settle existing funding programmes that they're part of, uh, pension liabilities. Uh, a lot of this funding could go on for many, many years to come. Polit 
politically a hugely sensitive issue in the UK, as is the issue of EU immigrants, one of the main reasons people voted to leave the EU, um, and all of this will have to be worked out over the months ahead. Um, in parallel to that, there will have to be a very substantial discussion hopefully a negotiation about a transition deal. And I think you know, this is probably the issue that is of most interest currently to most people because um, a transition deal would probably allow for the continuation of, um, of tariff-free trade, maybe. It may allow for the continuation of passporting rights, for example, maybe. But all of this will have to be f figured out over the course of the, the, the period from now until um, until October uh, 2018, and, um, and that will be difficult. It's going to be very difficult because those who campaigned for a British exit from the EU promised that they would take control of their borders, that EU citizens would not be able to, um, to travel freely into the, into the UK to work and to claim benefits and so on. The EU has a very different view of that. Um, uh, you know, there are um, commitments that were made during the campaign around um, not another red cent being paid into the EU budget, yet um, politicians in the UK will have to explain well, if we want to have this transition deal, we're absolutely going to have to settle this bill, um, and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's very complex. It's going to be very politically, um, politically uh, challenging um, for British politicians to explain. Uh, and of course, the other, um, the other contentious issue um, is that the UK has, has said categorically they want to leave the jurisdiction of the ECJ, but you can't continue to, to trade and carry on with a transition deal um, which essentially allows the continuation of the EU relationship with the UK uh, without being under the um, jurisdiction of the ECJ. So all of these are really, really, really tricky um, and massively politically sensitive issues. So you know, when people say, "Well, of course," and I, you know, I've, I've heard this from very significant companies and business leaders, you know, of course there has to be a transition deal, of course there's going to be a deal, and you know, we have four or five or possibly six years um, before a free trade agreement is, is negotiated, so this interim period will be managed um, you know, very carefully and responsibly. Um, don't underestimate how politics can trump, trump economic logic. Um, I have a lot of experience of it, um, and unfortunately, you know, <laughs> economic logic does not always prevail, and these are, you know, these are really fundamental um, uh, political challenges that face Prime Minister Theresa May and face um, her colleagues in the Cabinet. Um, and with the absence of any real meaningful opposition in the UK uh, coming from a more moderate point of view, um, I think we can expect it to be very, very tricky and very, very difficult. So we have a very bumpy road ahead. Um, I suppose one of the things that I think is also just worth mentioning or noting is, um, you know, when we talk or when we listen to our, our friends across the water talking about the new opportunities to assert themselves globally and all of the wonderful new free trade agreements that are going to uh, be pursued by the UK, um, you know, the, the, the figures tell a kind of a different story. Um, the UK exports um, more to the rest of the EU um, than any other part of the world. Um, the UK is heavily reliant on the EU market. Almost, almost 50% um, of its goods and services are exported to the rest of the EU. Whereas um, UK exports to, um, to Australia, for example, um, amount to just over 1%. Um, and in, in services, it's, it's substantially less than that. UK exports to India um, uh, amount to, uh, again, about 1.2%. Um, so these are tiny, minuscule markets for the UK. Um, all of these jurisdictions have expressed a clear intent to engage and negotiate with, um, with the European Union as a priority, uh, as a much bigger market, obviously, of 450 million people as opposed to 60 million. Um, and, uh, and I just think that you know, this is a certain um, re re realism that has yet to enter the debate in the UK. 
From our point of view, and it's just one final point that I would like to address um, before I start to conclude, um, is that you hear repeatedly, I mean, there is a growing mood in Ireland, um, you know, of, well, there's, all, there's always an anti-EU um, a, a voice in Ireland, and you'll have, have that everywhere. Um, but there's a growing, since the Brexit vote, there's a growing sort of momentum behind this. Well, maybe we should consider leaving too. Um, there's one diplomat who seems to be on every single radio show and every single television show and is writing for every single newspaper at the moment saying that we should we should leave the European Union and um, I just think that we need to think long and hard about that. I mean the UK is a really important market for us, there's no doubt about it. it counts for 14% of our export in goods um, nearly 20% of our exports in services um, but the EU is a much bigger market, much more important to us. Um, 40% of our goods are exported to the other EU countries, to the rest of the European Union, and 35% of our services are exported to the rest of the EU. And that's before you start to look at our trade with the rest of the world, all of which is negotiated through uh, EU arrangements, EU free trade deals, or trade and investment partnerships, various types of trade models. But that, that is, you know, unequivocally, that is where our economic interest lies. Our economic interest also lies in trying to ensure that we don't have you know, the UK crashing out of the EU uh, and entering into the WTO trading system. Um, that would be very, very damaging, particularly for certain sectors. Obviously, the agri-food sector being the most exposed, uh, with potential tariffs of, um, of up to 50% on, on beef products, for example, uh, and across the board, it would be, it would be very, very damaging. Um, and we have to be very conscious of that and aware of it. But um, but overall, you know, we export a hell of a lot more to the rest of the EU than we do to the, to the UK. And um, and our future, you know, opportunities and new markets will only be opened up to us through our relationship with the EU and through new free trade agreements that will be negotiated by the EU. And I think anybody who, you know, somehow tries to understate that or or, or claim that that's not the case, um, they really don't have facts on their side. Um, so I suppose in short, um, we have a, a very, very, very bumpy and challenging few years ahead. Uh, sadly, it won't end uh, in March 2019. Um, that will be the end of the formal exit process. Uh, that will be the point that the UK leaves the European Union and much as I'd like to think that that might change, I, I don't anticipate that it will. Um, and really we just need to look at how we can manage Ireland's position as a gateway to Europe, as a gateway to the world, how we can continue to be competitive, how we can continue to be an attractive destination for business, um, and how we can help Irish indigenous business to export abroad. Uh, and there will have to be um, resources put in place for all of this. Um, it's one of the things that I think the government now needs to start looking at really seriously. Um, yes, we have to focus on the Article 50 negotiations, but we also have to look at how we insulate certain sectors of the economy. That will mean transfers. Uh, I think that there's potential for EU funding in that regard, um, but there'll probably also have to be government funding, um, and we have to work out a, a deal between Ireland and the, and the European institutions as to how that can work uh, and how we ensure we don't breach um, certain um, uh, competition guidelines and so on in, in all of that. Um, and we also have to resource our agencies. Uh, and I was delighted to see IDA being recognised for the excellent work they do, and they're fantastic. Likewise, Enterprise Ireland and Borbia. And, you know, they are all operating on what is effectively a pittance in terms of budget. It's been increased slightly since last June, but it needs to be, it will need to be increased, um, certainly on a, on a probably five or, five or six year basis. It'll have to be increased substantially so that we can begin to identify and access these new, new markets for Irish goods in particular. Um, and we also have to prepare ourselves to absorb the new industry that can come to Dublin, uh, particularly in financial services. Um, you know, some worrying signals which I alluded to earlier with um, the likes of AIG and Lloyds and others announcing that they're going to destinations other than Dublin. Um, I think we have, to, we have to be really alert to that. Um, we have to ensure that our regulator uh, and our agencies are equipped to deal with these large multinationals, um, answer the questions that they have, facilitate their smooth entry into the Irish market, and we have you know, significant challenges around that, but we can do it. Um, but we have to be prepared, and unfortunately we can't allow the grass to grow. We don't have a whole lot of time. Um, th these are pretty 
immediate and imminent priorities as, these, as a lot of these companies are taking their decisions uh, right as we speak. Um, so I think I might leave it there for now. Um, there is a whole, a whole discussion to be had about Ireland's place in the EU post-Brexit, about the new um, dynamic that will exist without the UK, the challenges that will face us as a member state in the EU without the UK as our sort of buffer, as it has been on many issues, many regulatory issues and policy issues for, for many years. Um, but we can do it if we prepare and we're looking ahead and looking around corners um, from, from this point on. Uh, and that's why I say we really don't have any time to waste. Um, but I want to thank you for allowing me to share my, some of my thoughts with you. Obviously, it's a very broad, wide-ranging uh, topic that I could talk about all day, but I've tried to hit some of the key points, and I'm happy to either answer any questions or talk to any of you directly after the lunch. And uh, thank you once again for, for your attention and for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you.